Let's go ahead and get started with our program today. On behalf of our sponsors, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's Maritime Economic Forecast Breakfast. Um, my name is Sarah Shearer. I am the Maritime and Manufacturing Advocate for the Office of Economic Development for the City of Seattle. And I also have the pleasure of being the president of the Seattle Propeller Club. The Seattle Propeller Club is one of our city's largest maritime organizations and represents all aspects of the workboat fishing, fishing industry um, in the maritime industry. We are proud to join in presenting our economic forecast breakfast with the Port of Seattle and King County Maritime. Special thanks to our breakfast presenters, uh, presenting organizations, the North Seattle Industrial Association, the American Waterway Operators, Northwest Marine Trade Association, the Transportation Institute, the Seattle Marine Business Coalition, National Fisherman's Magazine, and the Pacific Marine Expo. Today's breakfast is streaming online through the Expo Online. We're also recording this event and we'll have the program on the sponsor's website. If you have questions today, please use the question and answer section or the chat box area. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of one of our speakers, uh, at our breakfast today, the speakers will uh, present an economic snapshot of our region's thriving maritime industry and the challenges we face in 2021. Our speakers today include Seattle Times economist columnist, the director of the Washington State Department of Commerce, representatives from the Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance. Unfortunately, due to the press of uh, business in Washington, D.C., Senator Perry, Patty Murray is unable to join us today. And um, I'm sad that we can't see each other um, face to face. This is one of my uh, happy places and breakfasts um, that we do, um, usually looking over the Seahawks Stadium. So to kick us off, uh, our program this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce the one, the only, Eugene Washerman, president of North Seattle Industrial Association. Eugene. Great. Thank you, Sarah. On behalf of the North, oops, on behalf of the North Seattle Industrial Association, I want to add my welcome to this morning's breakfast. The North Seattle Industrial Association is the premier organization for North Seattle Maritime Manufacturing Industrial Support and its property owners. Today is my pleasure to introduce John Tolton, who is the economic columnist of the Seattle Times. Uh, due to scheduling, we recorded John's remarks and questions and answer session with Charlie Costanzo. In three decades in journalism, John has worked as a reporter, editor, and investigative journalist. He has covered business and finance, specializing in urban economies, energy, real estate, economics, and public policy. Before coming to Seattle in 2007, God, he's been here a long time. Um, I remember when he came, it means I've been here a long time. John worked at the Arizona Republic, Charlotte Observer, Cincinnati Inquirer, Dayton Daily News, and the Rocky Mountain News in Denver. John also is an author and historian, has written 12 mysteries and thrillers and one work of history. It's my pleasure to introduce John Tolton. Very glad to be with you this morning. Uh, these are uncertain times. Uh, it's not the first time we've been through something like this, uh, but uh, nobody saw this coming in early 2020 uh, until we get past the pandemic, uh, nothing is going to be moving right. And this is going to be affecting the maritime sector, uh, not least of all. Um, as all of you know, uh, shipping is way down with the exception of, of certain agricultural products. Uh, the uh, ports in the Puget Sound area are uh, suffering, uh, and and this is on top of the the triumph of the previous decade, where we created the 
a Northwest Seaport Alliance and eliminated the, the very harmful competition between Seattle and Tacoma. There are some major infrastructure projects in both Seattle and Tacoma uh, that have to go ahead. That will take some uh, real leadership and some patience. Uh, the cruise industry lost an entire year, incredibly costly, and there's no guarantee that that will come back uh, next year either, unless the new administration can really have a laser-like focus on science and expertise, uh, and I hope that happens. Um, on the international front, uh, our exports uh, from the Northwest are down. Uh, significantly. And this really matters to Washington, which is a trade dependent or trade vulnerable state, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, China is our largest trading partner. The uh, trade war with China has been very unhelpful, uh, but also antagonizing allies like Canada. And uh, this has uh, uh, affected uh, container traffic, it's affected shipping um, in a lesser, but in, in our neck of the woods, important area. Uh, Alaska continues to be hurt by uh, low oil prices and if not a recession, just kind of a slow economy. And uh, Seattle and Tacoma are the cargo gateway to Alaska. And so, that will be something that we'll need to keep an eye on next year, too. Um, you folks are dealing with uh, regulatory uh, issues already on the international front as far as uh, lowering the sulfur content on on, uh, on the bulk fuel. Uh, it is painful, but it's necessary because uh, climate change is our biggest long-term challenge. Um, and that not only affects the 10,000 mile supply chain, but it's going to affect the uh, ability of the fishing fleet to maintain its sustainability. Uh, if the uh, uh, catch keeps moving farther and farther north or diminishing altogether, then that's a very bad thing for you and for us because one of the things that that makes uh, the Seattle area so uh, powerful economically is this diversity. Uh, this is not just a tech town, it's not just a Boeing town, it's also a maritime town and a maritime region and we benefit enormously from that. Um, I think the new administration uh, will have aspirations for infrastructure investments, uh, many of which could help ports and logistics. Um, how much of that gets through if there is a Republican Congress in opposition is hard to say, but we can hope. And so that's the overall view. And with that, I would thank you for your time and be happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, John. Appreciate those. Appreciate those thoughts. Um, got a couple questions for you, just regarding, um, you know, in terms of uh, a, a new administration and uh, potential approach to climate change, um, and and also kind of the role of or the role of our state government in that. Um, you know, how likely do you see it um, if, if the potential of whether Jay Inslee is joining the new administration? I know there's been some talk about Jay Inslee going to Washington, D.C. and taking a cabinet position or EPA or something like that. Um, how do you see the new administration's approach to climate change and uh, potential for integration between what's happening at the state level, uh, whether it's a low carbon fuel standard and, and those economic impacts going forward? Uh, under 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 a Biden administration. Well, I think that that Biden uh, takes the settled science of human caused climate change seriously, and hopes to phase in uh, changes to lower emissions. And uh, this is not going to be overnight. It's not going to be banning fracking or fossil fuels or anything like that. 
but it will be a gradual change that I think almost uh, uh, all uh, major companies and the Pentagon agree needs to happen to uh, uh, help crossing, help prevent crossing the threshold on climate change. Uh, I think on the on the state level, um, the the there is an axiom that that uh, too often uh, Washington uh, governments, at, whether at the state or local level, do not pay attention to the importance of maritime, and so I think that's an open question. I, it, frankly, it would surprise me if Inslee went to Washington to the other Washington because it's a lot more fun being the governor of a state than it is just being a member of a cabinet, much less the head of a regulatory agency like the EPA. But who knows? Thanks. Um, looking also maybe more, more at a regional level, um, you talked about the economic diversity and the contribution of economic diversity from the maritime industry. Um, obviously, we have seen some really a, a catastrophic situation in the in the airline industry and to the extent that you know obviously the pandemic has boosted some tech fortunes but it's definitely damaged some aerospace fortunes and um to the extent that um you know seattle is a boeing town or this region is a boeing region um how do you see those diminished fortunes impacting the space for the maritime industry um, and, and that relationship going forward post-pandemic? I think in general, the, the federal government has not done a good job uh, getting stimulus funds to industry, whether it's aerospace or whether it's maritime. And that needs to change. And there needs to be a real focus, uh, not only on uh, sustaining the jobs, but uh, on sustaining the actual industries because we have a, a for instance a maritime ecosystem here that can't be replaced the same way that we have an aerospace ecosystem that can't be replaced uh, Boeing has some problems of its own making with the 737 max um, it's making a big mistake I think by consolidating assembly of the um, Dreamliner in South Carolina when you've got one of the two great aerospace clusters in the world, the other being Toulouse, France, right here in, in Puget Sound. Um, but uh, Boeing will be diminished here. Um, it remains to be seen how much, but the, the economy is much more diverse than it once was. You know, we're not probably going to see uh, a 1970s uh, last person out of Seattle turn out the lights, but we it will be a headwind. Looking at another regional component of it, John, um, you mentioned Alaska and the connection of our of, of our region to the Alaskan economy, whether it's through fishing or freight or oil and gas. Um, They've, they've got some pretty unprecedented problems um, from a state budget standpoint as well and from a financial standpoint. Um, how, do, how do you see that situation developing going forward? And um, how, can, how can the maritime, maritime industry position itself to um, remain vital in Alaska as Alaska is undergoing those changes too? Maritime will always be vital to Alaska just because uh, Alaska has so much coastline and it's so dependent on uh, uh, maritime, whether it's container traffic or Roro or whatever, uh, to get uh, goods up there and to get them back down, um, uh, especially oil. The, the Alaska economy has been suffering for quite a long time because of low oil prices. This goes back to 2017, and much of Alaska's fiscal situation has been always predicated on pretty high oil prices. So the Alaskans not only didn't have to pay much in taxes, but they actually got a, 
a little check on the side thanks to oil and that's all gone down the drain and and not because of some nefarious socialist plot but just because of a glut in world oil plot prices and the, that's not going to change anytime soon and the the other part of the problem is then when you work in the pandemic and so the two of those things are going to keep the Alaskan economy struggling for a while and I think that uh, the maritime sector is going to have to be uh, as flexible and as opportunistic as it can be, realizing that this is a long-term problem. Thanks, John. Thinking more locally, um, as you know, a, a longtime correspondent for the Seattle Times and looking at the city of Seattle, um, how, do, how does um, recovery from the pandemic, um, the, uh, you know, agitations and, and arguments over, over the head tax, uh, concerns over uh, uh, shoreside and maritime and manufacturing and industrial lands and those land use pressures, um, how do you see uh, the city's response to its maritime industry and its manufacturing base going forward in sort of considering what the pandemic has done for the city in terms of um, impacts to employment, impacts to land use pressures, and obviously some of those, some of those concerns around um, equity and uh, social justice issues as we look at the city council try to tackle those as well in that same, in the, contemporaneously with uh, these economic these economic constraints, I'm very concerned. The city hall, the city council, the mayor—they're very woke, uh, but they're not very practical. There's an antipathy to business, whether you're Amazon or whether you're just operating a tugboat. Um, there's nobody on city council who has uh, private sector business experience. It's a group of activists. And here's the thing, without a vibrant economy, you can't have social justice. Social justice begins with good jobs. Social justice begins with a vibrant economy that creates tax revenues. And right now we don't have any of that. And I, uh, I don't see an understanding at City Hall. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, city is becoming less attractive to investment because of the um, um, protests that have been sullied by uh, arson and looting and uh, attacks on the police, uh, those things aren't helpful. Steve Jobs said that the axis is not between left and right. It's between constructive and destructive. And out of City Hall, I'm not seeing constructive policies. I'm not seeing any understanding of the value of maintaining our industrial lands and our maritime sector uh, viability here. Um, you know, do they understand that the BNSF Railway has one of its most important gateways right here south of downtown Seattle, uh, the connection to the port? Um, is, Tacoma is fortunate in that because the port is such a big part of its industrial sector, uh, it doesn't face the challenges that the Port of Seattle, uh, the seaport part, faces in, in Seattle and in uh, not seeing uh, our industrial lands in Soto and elsewhere uh, just overrun with condos. We've got plenty of places to build. We need to keep that diversity in the economy. Do you anticipate it would lead to a shift in kind of a, a center of gravity southward? Uh, it might. If, if we were a little closer, we, we could say that T-Town that, uh, is, is Oakland to Seattle, San Francisco. Um, we need uh, a BART subway to, to link the two cities. Uh, we need uh, many, many more commuter trains. Um, but 
I don't think that that the uh, region is benefited by uh, Seattle being hostile to its existing uh, seaport and uh, you know this is a, a natural deep water seaport those don't come along everywhere we pay taxes here so that they can try to dredge Savannah and Charleston and places like that to compete against us not to mention the places on the Gulf Coast we've got a natural deep water seaport here that we we need to value and that more Seattleites must have an understanding of and this is something Port commissioners have banged their heads against for years and years. Um, but uh, yes, there is some shifting south and it could, more could happen. Uh, the, the Port of Tacoma or the South Seaport as the Northwest Seaport Alliance calls it, uh, does have more rail advantage than, than Seattle. There's no dredge involved. But Seattle has some advantages too, and we need to keep them both. We need to keep them both; they're both viable. That should be an economic uh, priority. Thanks, John. Well, that's all I've got. I, I really appreciate it. Anything else to add before before we let you go? No, don't go away. We need you guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, John and Charlie, for that presentation. Um, you know, I really thank John for highlighting the need to sustain and grow the maritime industry. Um, we do have a natural deep water port and the maritime infrastructure and network that can't be replaced. I also appreciated the charge to be flexible and um, op uh, op optimistic and to uh, keep the diversity of our economy with um, industrial areas. So. Our next segment will focus on how our state is working to support our economy and the maritime sector. And to introduce our speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome Peter Schrappen from the Northwest Marine Trade Association and the president of the Washington Maritime Federation. Peter, thank you for joining us. Hey, Sarah, I uh, just wanna thank you for all your service at City Hall. And I wanna thank Ken for organizing today's big event. Ken Saunderson, ladies and gentlemen, is tireless when it comes to putting this event and others together. So thank you both. Uh, good morning to everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Director Lisa Brown. While it doesn't seem that long ago, I worked for Senator, then Majority Leader Lisa Brown 15 years ago. A few things have changed since then, like I'm staring into a box right now, talking to you all. But one thing that hasn't changed is Director Brown's desire to hit the ground running and to talk about the end before we get going. She's a consensus builder. She always has been, and she's the type of leader that uh, actually Congressman Kill and I were just talking about yesterday. We were talking about you, Director Brown, yesterday about how you like to start with the end in mind when you start a project. And actually a little trivia, uh, Joshua Berger and I were the first meeting that Director Brown took when she started at the Director at Department of Commerce. And we talked about the state's $38 billion maritime economy. We talked about my favorite part of the sector, the state's $8 billion recreational boating sector. And we talked about uh, the importance of having Joshua Berger at the helm at the Department of Commerce as our sector lead. Um, I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. Director Lisa Brown, take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, and, and good morning, everyone. I wish we could all be together this morning, uh, but we can't, uh, so I brought my own coffee. Uh, if, uh, um, it's a beautiful day here in Spokane. And I wanna just start by thanking the organizers of this event. It's really important to come together and understand and, and learn about our challenges and opportunities. So thank you so much to the Pacific Marine Expo and the Seattle Propeller Club and the Port of Seattle for hosting this event. And I'll just, uh, again, echo what Peter said. Uh, Joshua Berger, the work that he has done uh, to help connect us to the sector as our sector lead in maritime is really a model for the work that the Department of Commerce uh, is doing with other sectors. He's really leading the, leading the way in demonstrating how public-private partnerships can, can really um, create the right information flow and the right political advocacy to get things done on behalf of economic activity and jobs. And, we appreciate the maritime sector at Commerce, not just for its 
its size of $38 billion, but really for its historic and cultural significance as a legacy uh, industry, as an economic engine uh, for the whole state, because it is in fact, there are in fact companies and, and work being done across Washington state. And that is really significant to us. I'd like to share a little bit with you about the Department of Commerce and how we're working through this incredibly challenging public health and economic uh, crisis and, and how we in particular want to work with the maritime industry. So let's go ahead and bring up our slides and I will uh, show you a little bit about um, what our, our plan is. Um, we at the Department of Commerce and I'm not sure who's doing the slides for us, but um, thank you, whoever is going to pull those up for us. Um, we at the Department of Commerce have a, a short name, Commerce, but we have a long trajectory here uh, of, of uh, involvement with not only economic development, but also with respect to uh, local government infrastructure. We support the work of the Public Works Board and the and the Economic Revitalization Board. We support the work of um, housing and community services. And we also have the state's energy office. Um, I'm not gonna be able to drive the slides. So somebody else I believe is planning to do that. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, Joshua or who is gonna be able to do that, but. I don't have the capability to have the slides with me here to drive them. So hopefully while they're figuring that out, I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about what we've got going on. If you visit the Commerce website, you will see that we have um, an economic recovery dashboard. And I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, take a look at that. It will uh, show you by sector and by region of the state down to the level of counties, uh, how um, we are proceeding through this crisis and hopefully if we can turn the corner on the virus into um, uh, recovery, which is where we ultimately want to get to. And as Peter mentioned, uh, uh, looking at the end, I, I don't know about the end, but I will say that uh, the recovery that we envision is one in which uh, we actually uh, build back better with respect to both our infrastructure equity, uh, regional equity, demographic equity, and in terms of, of partnerships that uh, really could drive the maritime industry forward. So on our um, dashboard, you'll see that uh, we suffered the most uh, dramatic decline in employment that Washington State has, has seen since the Great Depression. And we share that obviously not just with the rest of the country, but with the rest of the world. This is in fact a global crisis. We've started to come back uh, and we want to come back even stronger and further, but we're still uh, barely back to the point where we were in the deepest point of the, of the last recession. Uh, we uh, also understand that uh, in order to pull out of this, we need an economic recovery strategy. And for uh, the Department of Commerce, what we'll be advocating for is infrastructure investments that you just heard about, the opportunities that we have in transportation infrastructure to, uh, to take on the challenge of, of the climate crisis and, and turn it into uh, an opportunity to innovate and lead the world. Uh, we believe that uh, universal broadband access is absolutely essential to a better recovery. And we also think that working um, sector by sector is really key uh, to this recovery as well. Um, so uh, with respect specifically to maritime, we uh, are invested along with you and federal partners. I'll just stop to say that uh, we do need federal action. There is just no doubt that we uh, wouldn't even be where we are right now had there not been the early action in the spring at the federal level. 
the amount of CARES Act funding that has come through the Department of Commerce, nearly, nearly uh, $3 billion, and the, um, uh, the unemployment support uh, of, of $12 billion. I think about what that adds up to, $15 billion uh, circulating in the Washington state economy because of those federal investments that were so desperately needed and they're about to run out and we need another, we need um, another um, package to be passed at the federal level. And I sincerely hope that that can happen before the end of the year. And I know Congressman Kilmer and others are, are working on that and I, we just need to get to agreement and, and get that done. Um, at the same time, the state will be in session soon and uh, they will have opportunities. There are certain um, levers that the state government can, can pull and push. We have the ability with our capital budget to do infrastructure spending. Uh, it would be fantastic to get a bipartisan transportation package through the legislature. Um, we, uh, there are policy measures that could also be taken to provide some relief sector by sector, particularly our hardest hit sectors. And we're very uh, hopeful uh, that even now with, um, as we start to determine uh, where we're at with the spending of our current CARES Act dollars, we've got a proposal in, in front of the governor related to maritime and we commerce are engaged in uh, deploying CARES Act dollars actually over $700 million of it in a variety of, of ways. And as you just heard from um, Governor Inslee on Sunday when he announced the, the new restrictions, another $50 million of business assistance coming our way that will be focused in the short run on the, the smallest businesses and on the sectors that are most hard hit, restaurants and, um, and, and so forth. And just in, encourage everybody as we move into the holiday season, it's still possible to support local independent businesses and those dollars recirculate faster in the economy. So that is a really important thing for us to do during this time frame. And um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about maritime specifically and the work that we have done to um, create this public private partnership um, that specifically results in the, the, the work of Maritime Blue as uh, an entity that, that pulls all these organizations together. And although it's only uh, been in existence for two years, I think it's demonstrated the ability to uh, uh, define priority projects and then bring the resources to bear to make those projects happen. Uh, so that's been fantastic. Um, when uh, Joshua, his team, and the collaboration of Maritime Blue created the st state's strategy for the blue economy, uh, we knew that having an independent organization was going to be key to achieving these goals. Uh, among the other things uh, that we've done is utilize a tool we're calling a joint innovation project. And that is the way bringing multiple partners together to, to do specific, to work on specific initiatives, whether it's um, projects like zero emission uh, vessels or shore, shore side infrastructure. That is um, the, the potential of that we are learning is something that we want to apply to other key sectors in Washington's economy, um, like force products and life sciences, et cetera. Um, uh, if, uh, if you want to pull up the slides, I know somebody's got them. I'll jump through, I'll jump through them really quick, quickly, and we'll get to a couple of, of key interesting ones at the end. But um, I wanted to mention in, in addition that workforce development is so important. And one of the projects I really love that Maritime Blue has been engaged in is the Youth Maritime Collaborative, uh, creating the ability for young people from diverse backgrounds to have opportunities and pathways 
to get engaged with the sector. Again, I think it's a model for other industries and something that uh, shows us that there's not just a great legacy and past uh, to the industry. There, there actually is a great future as well if we invest in it and in, if we invest in, in the young people who can be part of it. Um, I want to turn my, our attention specifically to, to COVID and to what needs to happen there. Uh, we are working uh, with the um, uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Seattle, on a project to uh, do early detection and prevention of COVID. And uh, again, uh, those of you who are engaged in the industry, despite the risks, despite the challenges, you're out there, you're making it happen, making sure we get our food and making sure that the products can move. Uh, and I thank you for that. And we want to be engaged in making you safer and keeping this economic activity going and thriving. And so this project uh, will be part of that. And we can answer questions about it. Of course, Joshua has, has more information on it. And then I wanna mention the accelerator it, uh, model. The idea that we come together, support new companies across the spectrum with potential technologies, products, and services that can support our goals in, in decarbonizing uh, our ferries and the ocean economy or our goals in diversifying our, our workforce and, uh, and spreading the economic uh, prosperity of the of this um, region across the whole state. So that accelerator model is now uh, going with its second class, and uh, it and it will have a home um, at the port, and we're very excited. And again, um, the model works because the collaboration was able to exert the advocacy at the state legislative level to to, you know, to provide a capital investment. In, in that um, facility and that will enable um, the work to happen and the collaboration to happen. And I've seen that happen firsthand when we're able to, to actually congregate and communicate in, um, in buildings. Again, that uh, accelerator will be a real um, jewel of, uh, of uh, new economic activity for the region. So that's a big picture. I did it without the slides. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions. And um, so please let me know which ones you would like me to answer. I see a few in the chat. Thanks, Director Brown. It's Charlie Costanza with the American Waterways Operators. Um, I'm going to be walking through the uh, through some of the Q&A that we've gotten. Um, that was a really uh, that was a really great presentation, and it's really exciting to have you in charge of our of, of the economic recovery at the state level. Uh, um, there, there's uh, as Fred mentioned, there's no better person to direct the state's recovery efforts at the moment. Um, uh, Com uh, Commissioner Fellman of the Port of Seattle um, was curious to know a little bit about uh, your work promoting Washington's export markets within the tug and barge sector. I can say that one of the areas that has not given back as much market share uh, with, the COVID, with the pandemic uh, um, challenges has been a grain export on the Columbia Snake River. Uh, those guys are doing extremely well from a, from a maritime freight standpoint. Um, could you talk a little bit about promoting Washington's export markets, uh, Vietnam and Northwest Seaport Alliance and how, and how, we, can, how we can build on some of those synergies? That, that's really important. I mean, the Northwest Seaport Alliance and that collaboration is significant. We've been happy to meet with them. And, and we have put forward um, the uh, proposal that, you know, the state used to invest more in its international trade activities. We had, we had trade offices in, in key markets around the world. And that fell away in the last recession. Well, we've got to reinvest in that. We don't have to do it alone as the Department of Commerce. We see the, the port, uh, the Seaport Alliance and the Department of Agriculture as, as key partners in that. So we are now meeting and discussing how we can work together. We all do international trade activity, how we can share information and how we can, in some cases, knock down barriers. Just as an example, we're currently talking about um, a barrier 
to um, the wheat market in Vietnam for Washington wheat and working together with WSU doing, uh, doing the research part, Department of Ag and Department of Commerce investing in that to knock down that trade barrier and open up that market. Um, we had hoped to be in, in Vietnam right now as a collaborative with Department of Ag, Department of Commerce, Association for Washington Business. Obviously, we're not there, but we are doing virtual international trade shows. And the Department of Commerce has also received the largest uh, step grant from the federal government, which allows us to make um, further grants to businesses that want to explore international trade activities. So again, please please get in touch with us and um, give us your suggestions and also uh, take a look at the resources we may, might be able to provide. Thank you, Director Brown. Uh, we're getting a number of questions about uh, workforce development, training, apprenticeships. Um, I saw your answer to the uh, question posed by Barrett Erickson. Barrett asked whether uh, the new COVID restrictions would impact maritime training businesses. And as you answered in the chat, uh, they won't impact the training facilities. But can you talk a little bit about um, how the state is working to build workforce training in the maritime sector, manufacturing, industrial, apprenticeship opportunities, um, and encouraging kind of curriculums that will, will, will drive workforce development in that area? Yeah, that's really important. I think that We've done some good things in our state. We've got great uh, research institutions. We've got a very well-developed community uh, and technical college system across the state. But one of the things that we've realized is that good workforce development means pathways that don't always involve a two-year degree or two-year or a four-year degree, uh, that they can be quicker, they can be, de they can be delivered in innovative ways. Uh, not just on a, on a campus, and that, that we have to do the connecting of individuals, whether they are young people who have not had higher education experience or partially uh, completed a higher education or uh, people returning like vets, returning uh, back into the workforce or people displaced and get them into these pathways. And the, the model that we're investing in is both through our workforce board at Washington State, but also through Career Connect and uh, um, uh, apprenticeships have turned out to be a really key part of this. It's, it's, an, it's an ancient concept, right? It goes back to the middle ages, but that concept of working, on, uh, working and learning at the same time and frankly, being compensated is really key. I mean, how many people can really take the time and have the, have the resources to take time off work in order to invest in getting those skills? It's, it's not practical. Um, I can tell you it's not practical for a single mom like I used to be. It's not practical for many people who have families and just not the, the wherewithal. So they can often get, get stuck in a lower wage dead end kind of, of position and, and apprenticeships break us out of that. And so uh, that um, development and the work that, that we can continue to do there to create communication between the industry and the, um, the education institutions and our workforce organizations about what are the concrete skills that are needed and we have to be up uh, we have to be on top of this because those change right um, wood products it's it's not what you might think you've got to you've got to be able to uh, uh, deal with very sophisticated machinery and we've got to be able to provide that training wherever it's needed across the state so um Thank you very much. Another, another quick question, well, not a quick question, it's a challenging problem. Um, an issue that we've dealt with at the, at the, at the federal level is within the, um, the next COVID package, one of the, um, uh, from legislation, one of the big challenges has been around liability. And many of the operators, many of the, the uh, participants in this conference are involved in essential services, whether it's food production, freight transportation, also operating on a boat where there's the ability to quarantine and minimize contact with um, you know, the, the shoreside. And how, 
do you are you in contact with the federal delegation in Washington about striking some balance between providing liability protection around employees, employers of essential workers, and also making sure that employers provide a safe environment? How are you handling that situation and in, in your engagement with the federal delegation? Well, that's, you know, that's a really important question. And I, I wish I had like, oh, we're in touch on a regular basis. And, you know, um, but the reality is we work through our Washington DC office and the most significant message that we're sending is to uh, pass um, a package. And having my own experience in the legislature, um, I have been part of some fairly spectacular collaborations where we came together and we compromised and we got the job done and we made good investments, whether it was working out thorny water issues or, or transportation packages or capital investments. Um, for example, during the last economic downturn when I was in the state legislature, we came, across, we came together, Republican and Democrat, Senator Parlett and Wenatchee, Senator Kilmer, um, uh, from Gig Harbor and put together a capital um, budget that was much larger, taking advantage of the fact that we were in a downturn and there were low interest rates and it was the right time to invest. Um, and um, so all I can tell you is that with the liability issue, which is an, an issue that, that, that is being kind of tied up with continuing unemployment benefits and a stimulus package, it's, you, it's sitting down and I realize it's harder to sit down at a table right now, but then sit down in a Zoom or sit down six feet apart with masks on and hash out a compromise and pass it for people. And, not, and everybody's not gonna get what they want out of that package, but um, there's usually a path forward if people listen to each other really carefully. And um, I understand we're very polarized right now, uh, and this probably isn't even the most popular thing to say, but I think compromise across the parties is what um, people in our country want right now. And it's and even if they don't want it, it's what we need. God willing, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, last last question uh, is relating to uh, infrastructure investment, uh, specifically around um, West Seattle Bridge and um, surface transportation, but specifically that piece of surface transportation that is um, a, a major, major source of concern for the maritime industry here. Yeah, well, there, there needs to be a solution there. I'm, I can't tell you that I know specifically which solution is best with respect to the West Seattle Bridge, but as that um, consensus emerges, the state has got to be a partner in it, all the more reason why we need a transportation package to occur in the legislature this session. And the federal government could also be a partner in it. And uh, clearly we need the whole regional economy to come together and make that happen because we are interconnected. I used to battle being from Spokane, people saying, why are we investing all that money in Western Washington? It's like, because, because our agricultural products need to get to the port because uh, we want people to be able to come back and forth and enjoy both parts of the state. And that's both personal and freight mobility are very key to that. And the West Seattle Bridge is obviously just, just a fundamental arterial in, that, uh, in our transportation infrastructure. So got to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Director Brown. Thank you so much for, for, for being with us today and spending some time with us and answering our questions. Um, thanks, Peter Schrappen, for the lovely introduction. Um, good, good luck. And uh, again, we really, really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thank Sarah? you. Sarah? Hi. Thank you, Director Brown. There's so many great things to highlight in your presentation. Um, thank you for the infrastructure investments, climate innovation, uh, universal broadband uh, for everyone, though working sector by sector, workforce development. There's so much stuff. Thank you so much. Um, we love Joshua Berger and the uh, Washington Blue um, and having everybody be pulled together in Youth Maritime Collaborative. Um, 
and the investment in our youth I could talk about for forever, but I won't, I promise. Um, so our next segment will focus on the work of the Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance to support our economy. Um, and I especially wanna acknowledge the support of our forecast breakfast presenting sponsor, the Port of Seattle. Uh, the Port has been a tremendous partner in our region's economic and community development. We also greatly appreciate their leadership in helping to support our industry initiatives throughout the year. And to kick off this segment, it is my pleasure to introduce the Port of Seattle's Commissioner President, Peter Steinbrook. Thank you for joining us this morning, Commissioner Steinbrook. Oh, wonderful, Sarah. It's so good to be here and such an inspiring way to begin the day with these terrific speakers with uh, a lot of uh, insights and perspective that I think are very well well taken, but well received. So thanks for the intro and thank you for your, your uh, recognition of the importance of our, our maritime industry and the, the ports, our seaport and the contributions we make to the, a vibrant uh, regional and statewide economy. I, let me mention, I'm also joined by commissioners Calkins and Fellman from the Port of Seattle. There may be other port commissioners here I'm not aware of, but Thanks uh, to them for joining us as well. We're gonna speak on maritime industries response to, to and recovery from COVID. And let me say, we are all about industry and we are all in. Today, you'll hear from our executive director of the Port of Seattle, Steve Metrick. I also wanna mention that uh, as president of the Port of Seattle Commission, I also serve as co-chair of the the Great Northwest Seaport Alliance with my colleague, Commissioner John McCarthy of the Port of Seattle, excuse me, sorry, John, <laughs> Port of Tacoma, the great city. Uh, we're pleased to have him here today as well. So with that, um, uh, I will also remind you uh, that at, uh, in relationship to our Northwest Seaport, as you know, the Alliance was established in 2015. I think it was a brilliant move on the part of the two seaports of Tacoma and Seattle. We have to enter into that partnership. It's a 50-50, uh, we share uh, expenses and we share revenues equally and to create a single authority to manage our robust container break bulk auto and some bulk terminals in Seattle and Tacoma, making us the fourth largest international container cargo port in North America. Uh, the seaport is governed by the ports of Seattle and Tacoma, as I mentioned, equally. And however, we remain separate organizations and we take responsibility uh, for our prospective home ports and the infrastructure needs that are uh, attendant there. Uh, and the West Seattle Bridge cannot go unnoticed. We sent a joint letter, the co-chairs of the seaport to Mayor Durkin and had a great conversation with her the other day. She's provided some really strong leadership on this uh, effort and we're expecting any time now, possibly tomorrow, an announcement on her course of action. So with that, I would like to now turn to our Executive Director, Coast Guard Admiral Steve Metrick. Steve? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Steinbrook. And uh, good morning, everyone. And before we get started today, I do want to thank Commissioner Steinbrook and all the port commissioners at the Port of Seattle for their leadership during this past, uh, these past nine months going forward. Uh, Commissioner Fellman and Commis Commissioner Calkins are with us today and uh, Commissioner Cho and Commissioner Bowman may or may not be, but I appreciate all their support uh, going forward, especially since they just passed our budget for 2021 yesterday. So I, and I also wanna thank the uh, Propeller Club, especially Ken for uh, organizing the event today and putting this event on. You know, I was reflecting back, uh, Sarah was talking about, you know, her happy place. And, and I think I was thinking back to where we were last year. Um, it, it really is my happy place as well. Looking out in the audience, seeing all parts of this, all different sectors of the maritime industry is really one of the enjoyable things. And last year's event was great. And who knew a year later that I'd be standing in my living room in a, in a sport coat, talking to 150 people from my dining room. So, but that's the times we're in now, and I think we're all adjusting to that. Um, next slide, please. There we go, we're working, we're connected. So I wanna talk about three things today. How we're weathering the storm that is uh, COVID-19. Um, 
What is our competitive strategy to keep the Pacific Northwest Gateway strong in the face of global pandemic and global competition? And what's next for the port in 2021 and beyond? Next slide, please. I'll start with our response and how we pulled through, through uh, the year of COVID-19. This is, this is, I'm just going to go over some of these things. This, everybody knows this already. The, the Port of Seattle is one of the region's largest platforms for economic activity. Director Brown's remarks about the, the importance of the maritime industry, I'm going to echo some of those. All of Washington's key economic sectors depend upon our services. Particularly during the pandemic, people are reminded of how critical it is that we maintain essential services in our supply chain. Marine cargo, fishing, and all other maritime industries represented here today provide $7.4 billion in business output and more than 32,000 jobs. When the port and maritime industries take a hit, this region feels it. Next slide, please. All of, our, all of our businesses have been impacted by the pandemic here at the port. It's been more severe and more sudden than anything we've see, ever seen in my, in my lifetime, far worse than 9-11 and then the Great Recession. The airport was hit the hardest, but we're seeing challenges everywhere. We lost all of our cruise season in 2020, which meant that local businesses lost out, of about, it lost out in about $900 million in business activity and the port lost out 20 and $24 million in revenue. We had to pause the study of our proposed new cruise terminal because of the uncertainty of the cruise industry going forward. We know that fishing and seafood processing industries are struggling too, especially with the decline in restaurant markets. Next slide, please. The most powerful thing we can do is restore the economy to restore the economies to safely restore operations. Our operations are the platform for jobs, the economic multiplier that keeps our economy growing. Safely maintaining and restoring operations is essential to our economic strategy. We are carefully reviewing our policies and protocols across all lines of business, especially in light of the, the governor's new order. When it comes to reopening facilities to customers, tenants and the public, we're following best practices such as physical distancing, robust cleaning protocols and more. I'm very proud and grateful of uh, that the, our many industries never missed a beat and were able to keep people safe at work. We also took action to help tenants survive this crisis and are ready and be, make sure they're ready to thrive in, the, in their recovery. This spring, our commission reiterated our commitment to economic development through capital projects. We have projects worth 1.5 billion un, currently underway today. I do wanna say one of the things that we did early on in the pandemic was to stop, make sure that we reviewed all the projects that we should continue on with those in light of the COVID, uh, COVID impacts and, and, and the commission revalidated those early in the year so that we could continue those important capital projects and to do them safely as well, to protect both the, both the workers and uh, port staff as well. The single largest maritime investment is at Terminal 5 in West Seattle by the Northwest Seaport Alliance, our joint venture with the Port of Tacoma. We look forward to the completion of the first phase of improvements in the spring, and you'll hear much more about it from, from uh, Northwest Seaport Alliance CEO, John Wolf. At the same time, we're continuing our investments and improvements for the fishing industry at Terminal 91 and Fisherman's Terminal. I'm very proud of the work by port teams and our contractors to adopt those sites, as I said, to safely operating during the pandemic. We've also made targeted investments in critical programs that bring a financial return to the region, like workforce development and tourism. Our commercial fishing fleet went out this summer, and with rigorous testing and screening, it appears that it had a successful season with comparatively few illnesses. Our private sector partners and, and customers at Terminal 91, which include the factory trawler fleet, conducted widespread COVID-19 testing of workers before departing for the fishing grounds. The port provided space at Fisherman's Terminal for COVID-19 testing of crew members of the boats moored there. The testing at both locations helped vessels comply with protocols put in place by the state of Alaska and the Department of Homeland Security. I have to say that Maritime was the real innovator and leader in this area. As we look to expand operations, we're look, looking at the commercial fishing model as something we may need to adopt to other business lines. 
We have a vision to, to, to have a globally competitive maritime industry here in Washington and Puget Sound. In order, to, in, order, <clears throat> in order to do that, we have to be innovative, sustainable, and inclusive, the themes that you've heard from the other speakers before. To advance innovation and entrepreneurship in the maritime industry, as you heard Director Brown discuss, the port is creating a maritime innovation center at Fisherman's Terminal. The Mink, as we call it, will repurpose the historic Seattle Ship Supply Building as light industrial facility to support maritime innovation and companies developing and adapting new technologies for our industry. We're partnering with the Washington State Department of Commerce through the Maritime Blue Initiative to help make the Innovation Center a reality. And it's great to hear Director Brown talk about how important this is to the state. In addition, we're well into design planning and permitting for a pair of 50,000 square foot light industrial buildings at the north end of Terminal 91. The buildings are the first phase of a master plan development to provide space for maritime and industrial companies. Construction of additional phases will depend upon the success and, success and speed of leasing out the first two buildings. A commercial real estate study of the Ballard Inner Bay area in 2015 show that the vacancy rate for industrial properties and structures is very low and demand is high. This project is our way of satisfying that demand and generating the revenue we need to continue to invest. This is also our way of anchoring maritime industri industrial businesses near our working waterfront. I'm gonna make a pitch here. Leasing opportunities for both facilities are now available. You can contact our senior director of real estate, Kara Lease, her email and phone number are on the slide. We'll be able to provide that to you if you're not quick on copying that down. None of this works if we cannot safely and efficiently move people and products around the region. It is one of the best competitive advantages and is a key element in our economic development strategy. For example, we help fund the Lander Street overpass, which opened in Seattle this fall. We're helping fund a new rail overpass in Kent. We are invested in the Puget Sound Gateway Project which provides essential highway connections to the ports of Tacoma and Seattle and helps ensure people and goods move more reliably throughout Puget Sound. So where do we go from here? We, we are in a moment where we must focus on fundamentals. We must return to a stronger financial position. We must focus on our competitive advantages and expand economic opportunity. We have done well as an organization to reduce expenses. We did that early on. We adopted a revised budget early in 2020, which the, which, the, uh, which the commission supported. It has served us well as we've gone through 2020. But we also have to raise revenue. A thriving local cruise industry is part of our economic strategy for maritime. There is a lot of uncertainty right now about the cruise industry, especially for 2021. But we're working with the, with the leaders in the cruise industry, all levels of government on the safe return of cruise in 2021. Returning to our proposed cruise terminal when appropriate is a critical part of our strategy to grow our cruise business. If you uh, tuned into our commission, uh, uh, commission meeting yesterday, you know that we're taking an assessment of the cruise industry as it develops through 2021. And this will help inform our pathway and decision forward. I think it's an important message for everyone who works in the maritime industry to, to hear. And that's that the, that the maritime division at the port and the whole, the whole economy is stronger when we have a thriving cruise industry. And we look to its safe return. I mentioned earlier, our strategy to be a globally competitive maritime industry requires us to be innovative, sustainable, and equitable. And you heard that also from Director Brown. You can see how we're using our community programs to advance those goals. Two examples I wanna call out for you today. The Maritime Accelerator launched this year at Maritime Blue. We heard a little bit about that. I'll give you a little more details. In April this year, 11 startups graduated after a successful showcase that led to a number of wins among the inaugural cohort, including a substantial Series A equity investment, seed level funding, and customer contracts. I have to say that, that one, of these, uh, one of these companies Discovery Health has also been part of the COVID response as well. Our workforce development and high school internship programs continue introducing more people to opportunities in a maritime career, bringing hundreds of individuals into career pipeline every year. And looking at those uh, communities, those less represented communities uh, in the workforce is something that we're able to look at as well. 
So as I'm tying up here, I do want to say is we cannot do any of this without the employees at Port Facilities and within with your, all of your organizations and your workforces. We're incredibly proud of your resilience, what we've done to keep everyone safe. You know, as uh, I think I want to be, op I'm optimistic now. If you would have asked me a couple months ago, there was lots of uncertainty out there. But I think as pieces are falling into place, including the, the uh, information about vaccines, further controls, I think that we can clearly see uh, the clearing ahead of us in the horizon, a clearing horizon ahead of us. So I'm really optimistic about 2021 and looking forward to uh, further discussions with you um, as we go into 2021. So with that, um, I believe uh, it's my privilege to introduce Port of Tacoma Commissioner and Northwest Seaport Alliance Managing Member, John McCarthy. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Steve. Good morning to all of you. Uh, the rapid spread of the coronavirus in the last eight months has had a major impact on global shipping markets, impacts that have been th felt throughout the industry. And bear in mind that this has occurred after a one and a half year trade war and a tariff war, uh, which has even had more of an impact on the Pacific Northwest uh, since our largest trading partner is China, as uh, John Talton mentioned earlier. Uh, before our CEO, John Wolf, gives some detail on how our very important, the Great Northwest Seaport Alliance, as Commissioner Steinbrook refers to it, uh, before he gives some input as to how we've adjusted uh, to meet uh, the COVID, I want to take a few moments to point out uh, some overarching concerns about our a continued loss of market share over the past uh, five years since the inception of the Seaport Alliance uh, to other uh, West Coast uh, gateway uh, ports, such as uh, Southern California, and also uh, to Canada, and also to the Gulf ports uh, after the, and the Eastern ports after the widening of the uh, Panama Canal. A recent study by Mercator, which is a well-respected local trade analyst, a study that was done at the behest of the Pacific Maritime Association concluded that other areas have developed some cost advantages over the Pacific Northwest uh, as a result of government support, working with uh, railroads and other factors. So this has put our uh, important uh, Seaport Alliance in a competitive disadvantage. Our terminal to rail, uh, transportation costs and other transport costs continue to get higher, and that's a problem uh, which can continue to uh, impact our intact intermodal traffic. So we've had to become uh, service oriented since there are a lot of factors that we can't control. Uh, but quite frankly, with the development of the very important Terminal 5 in uh, Seattle, which will be a premier uh, international uh, gateway terminal, we quite frankly are over capacity in terms of marine terminals and we need to be creative in using some of our terminals for other maritime, marine and industrial orientated uses that can create jobs. As a regional community, we need to step up our game to support what the Alliance can continue to do for our economy, but we need to be open to other industries that are available. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Wolf, who's going to talk about the Seaport Alliance response uh, to COVID-19, John. Well, thank you, uh, Co-Chair McCarthy and uh, Co-Chair Steinbrook. First of all, I, I just wanna put a finer point on what the commissioners mentioned about the Seaport Alliance. This is a unique partnership. It doesn't exist anywhere else in this forum in North America. And uh, it's not always easy, yet I will say five years in, it's been successful. Uh, and it, to a large degree, it's been successful by the commissioners that lead this organization. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Seattle and Tacoma are, are different cities. They each have their own strengths. And the port commissions that, uh, commissioners that represent these two cities have come together and a strong partnership to work together for the region and, um, and for the success of this gateway. And they deserve a tremendous amount of credit 
for their leadership and their collaboration amongst each other. Uh, 2020 has been, uh, no question, a challenging year. It's also been a year of a, a sort of a tale of two seasons. If you think back to late 2019, uh, we were in the middle of this trade war. Uh, COVID hadn't really shown itself in the United States in any form uh, of significance. And um, yet we were feeling the effects of our uh, trade with, um, with China, our number one trading partner, and the, and the drop in volume. And uh, of course, that uh, as we moved into 2020, we continued to feel the effects of this trade war. And then compounded by um, the pandemic that hit the United States uh, in the first quarter of last or this year. Uh, the combination of the two has made uh, the first half of the year extremely challenging and, and very volatile uh, in, in terms of the uh, cargo flow. The second half of the year is really a different storyline. As we move into peak season and we have um, this pent up demand for um, goods and, and the consumer spending that we've seen really in a much stronger fashion the second half of the year, it's created all sorts of different types of challenges um, than the first half of the year. And I'll talk about some of those things. But um, like any system, um, our, our gateway system functions best when there's consistency and, and consistent reliability through the supply chain. And we've had anything but that in 2020. So how have we responded to the, the pandemic? Well, it really starts with the partnerships that we have established over many years. Uh, the supply chain partners, our, our terminal operators, our, our labor partners, um, and all of the other stakeholders that make this gateway run. And, uh, and, and it begins with making sure that we have a safe environment for our workforce, because without our workforce, uh, we'd be brought to our knees. And uh, so it, there's been many steps taken. I'm not going to go into all those details. You can imagine that um, each and every day we're in close communication with these key stakeholders to ensure that we have a safe working environment and that um, our workforce can be productive, yet um, also be safe in, in the workforce. Um, we, we worked with uh, the federal government to distribute 30,000 masks uh, to employees and industry partners. That's just one of many examples where we partner with the federal government and, and state and local entities as well. Um, we have regular communication with our customers. Uh, this is a people industry. Relationships are critically important and it has been difficult, just like today, to communicate because um, our preferred form of communication is to sit down face to face, and that's been difficult. Yet we found new and innovative ways to communicate. And the good news is um, the uh, flow of information is still occurring, it's just happening in different forms. Uh, and then, um, as we moved into the second half of the year and peak season, we anticipated. Uh, an uptick in cargo, and uh, we had a game plan ready uh, in, in place for that uptick in cargo. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the impacts to the supply chain. Uh, it's been, again, as I said, a, an extremely volatile year, huge fluctuations in our cargo flows. Um, we've seen significant changes in consumer demand. The first half of the year, um, the, the demand was down. Uh, and um, now in the second half of the year, we're seeing tremendous demand for imports, which has put a heavy stress on the exports, which are also um, uh, strong right now. Uh, yet um, it's been interesting in the last few months, uh, the exporters are having a very difficult time finding equipment and space on vessels because um, the imports are so strong, rates have skyrocketed uh, on the import side. So the shipping lines are trying to get their equipment as quickly as they can back to Asia to fill that box with another high valued 
uh, shipment of imports back into the United States. So as much as there's demand for exports, it's been difficult for the exporters most recently to get a hold of that empty container and, and be able to load it with exports because of um, this pent up demand on the import side. Uh, so that's resulted in higher ocean freight costs. The shipping lines are all making money this year. That's a good thing, um, yet it's created stress in the supply chain. Um, we've also, as mentioned earlier, seen a shift in, uh, in, in cargo sourcing. It started with the, the tariff war and has continued to accelerate into uh, countries um, outside of China, our, our largest trading partner to um, uh, countries in Southeast Asia like Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and even India. Um, that has been a game changer for us because again, our number one trading partner is China and we've had to uh, quickly shift some of our focus to these other countries and make sure that uh, we've established good uh, trade relationships there and that we've got um, our supply chain in place to service those other uh, manufacturing countries. And I'll talk about a couple of examples of where we've done that momentarily. Um, we've also seen on the terminal side, huge challenges where the first half of the year we have under, had underutilized terminals because volumes were down. Um, now, uh, in, in this uh, second half of the year where we've seen an uptick of volume, we're seeing a different type of stress on the terminals where um, they are um, handling more cargo during peak season in anticipation of the holidays and uh, just this pent up demand and people's spending habits have changed where now they're spending more on household goods and things of that nature, spending less on travel uh, and, and still, though, spending uh, uh, on discretionary income, we're, we're seeing uh, the congestion in the terminals, uh, uh, lack of equipment availability, and um, that has just put a, a whole different kind of stress on the supply chain. So these huge swings, again, um, that we're trying to adjust to um, as, as we move along through the year. Uh, and, and all of these, uh, this volatility creates additional costs because um, you have to adjust in a, a very uh, quick and a, uh, uh, manner and, and you have to add costs, whether it's gate costs, terminal operating costs, um, costs for us in terms of trying to support our supply chain partners. So um, again, very challenging times. Next slide, please. So this chart is, is interesting in that it, it calls the, out the blank or canceled sailings that we've experienced. And, uh, and it's a comparison of three years, uh, 2018, 2019, and 20. Uh, the lighter blue is 2020. So you can see in the early part of the year, we had far more blank sailings as compared to 2018 or 2019. And that again, that's as a result of volumes being down with the trade war and the global pandemic. As you look at um, from July uh, and really August on, you can see that um, our blank sailings uh, fell off uh, dramatically, uh, which is, is indicative of a growth of volume the second half of this year that I mentioned. And you can see in October, zero blank sailings uh, for the month or for the year 2020. So, uh, very strong trade volumes uh, going into peak season and um, in, in the uh, latter part of this year. Next slide, please. This slide gives you uh, a sense of the flow of container trade through the gateway uh, going back to uh, last year all the way through October of this year. And you can see again the trend line where if you focus in on the latter part of last year, you can see um, the effects of the trade uh, trade war with China um, and our volumes falling off and continuing to fall off the first half of this year uh, with the trade war still in place combined with the global pandemic. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can see 
uh, volumes start to pick up in, in June, second half of this year, and uh, continuing to stay strong. And we expect that um, that will continue through the balance of this year and probably into the first quarter of next year. Next slide, please. So this gives you a snapshot of uh, a year-over-year -year comparison of our container volume from 2016 to uh, year-to-date 2020. And you can see that, um, again, that the overall impact of the trade war and the global pandemic and what it's had on our overall container volume through the gateway, um, pretty significant drop-off this year. That's been, that's been really challenging for us because um, both in terms of managing against our budget, where we have both fixed and variable revenue, a portion of our revenue is derived from uh, volume through um, that variable revenue. And so we've had to, like many businesses, adjust our spending accordingly to ensure that we have a strong financial performance. And it's been a challenging, challenging year this year. Uh, financially for us. Yet um, through some, some disciplinary action led by our commissioners, we've been able to uh, withstand uh, much of the uh, downturn in the, uh, with the volumes. The other thing I wanted to highlight here, obviously we're focusing on the container volume. We are a gateway uh, with customers that handle other types of cargo. And, and that's really important, like any business, to have a diverse portfolio business. We have our domestic trade with Alaska, which is very different than the international trade. We have uh, customers that handle brake bulk cargoes and automobiles, or row row cargo, as well as some bulk cargo with the grain. And the combination of those other cargoes being much stronger this year, most of them anyway, being much stronger this year, uh, that has helped offset some of the, the downturn with the container volume. Next slide, please. So one of the fundamentals of any port gateway, and ours is no different, is having a strong set of infrastructure. And that is the base by which you build your house. And so uh, when we formed the Seaport Alliance, part of our strategic plan was to continue to invest in our terminals and our supporting infrastructure. And in Tacoma, uh, we uh, were in the middle of uh, the redevelopment of Husky Terminal, one of the premier terminals on the West Coast. And you can see in the lower photo that has now been completed. Um, it has eight super post Panamax cranes that can handle the largest vessels that will call in Puget Sound. There are eight of the largest cranes on the whole West Coast. And we uh, also made significant improvements to the wharf and the upland yard area, as well as the gate complex. This again is a terminal, a premier terminal that can handle uh, large vessels and quite a bit of volume. Combined with our other Tacoma terminals, Washington United Terminal and Pierce County Terminal, the three terminals in Tacoma are three very capable, large international terminals. Shifting to Seattle, um, we, broke ground on uh, the redevelopment of Terminal 5. And we're in the middle of construction of that project. This is another key project for us and a really exciting uh, project that will come online, phase one of the terminal will come online mid-year next year. So um, less than a year from now, when you look out at Terminal 5, you're gonna see ultra large container vessels four of the largest cranes on the West Coast and a lot of cargo moving through this terminal. We will move right into phase two and complete phase two of the redevelopment of Terminal 5 um, right in the first quarter of 2023, so just around the corner. So again, a major capital investment by the Seaport Alliance, a partnership on both these terminals between the ports of Seattle and Tacoma. There are many other infrastructure projects that we are investing in. Um, as mentioned earlier, the Lander Street overpass, a critical freight corridor in the Seattle Harbor. Uh, the Gateway Project, 
we have to complete that gateway project and we're excited about where that's headed. Um, that's the um, completion of SR 167 and 509 in our region, uh, both critical freight corridors. Another key project that is um, closing in on completion, but we need to see it through is the I-5 Port of Tacoma Road connection. That's a key corridor for freight flowing out of the Tacoma Harbor onto Interstate 5. So these are examples of major projects outside of our terminals where we are investing heavily in partnership with local, state, federal government. Um, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the West Seattle Bridge um, that uh, we were throwing a curveball. The city was throwing a curveball with the failure of the upper bridge. What's really important there is that we maintain that lower bridge for freight. Well, we work um, uh, beside the city and supporting them in their efforts to decide whether to replace or repair that bridge. And the urgency around getting to a decision and getting that project completed is paramount because as I mentioned, T5 is coming online uh, early or middle of next year. Next slide, please. So uh, beyond our infrastructure investments, we have some key commercial initiatives that we've been working on even through these difficult times. It's more important now than ever that we find new and in innovative ways to connect with the supply chain and our customers. And I wanna highlight a couple of examples. These are just a few of many, many areas where we are uh, focused on uh, um, approaching the marketplace in these new and different ways than we have in the past. So the first is a partnership uh, with uh, Minot, North Dakota. And this is a partnership in combination with the BNSF Railroad uh, the economic development arm in Minot, and two of our largest shipping lines, where um, that Minot, North Dakota area is a key hub for exports. The challenge they had was they, they were struggling to get empty equipment into that area um, to uh, support the exports. And so the exports were finding their way to other gateways, quite frankly. And so through great effort by our team, and in combination with those other partners I mentioned, we were able to stand up a inland terminal facility that is privately operated where the shipping lines are repositioning empties in partnership with the BNSF to Minot where they can be loaded with exports and those exports are flowing through Seattle Tacoma Gateway. That is going to increase the volume that is moving through this gateway. The first train just came through our gateway about a week ago. So we're really excited about uh, this effort and uh, something to celebrate. And there are a couple of other key inland markets that we're looking at similar to Minot, where we can create a, a very similar kind of uh, supply inland supply chain terminal. Another area that we've been doubling down our efforts is with the emergence of e-commerce, we were really focused on um, taking advantage of that trend that is, is growing rapidly. And, uh, and Raymont Logistics is a good example of, of many, many other examples where they just announced that they are going to be um, joining our gateway as a partner, providing transloading services in the Seattle Harbor adjacent to Terminal 18 in the future uh, opening of Terminal 5 and um, taking uh, both imports and exports and transloading those into domestic containers and providing a valuable service for this gateway. So we're really excited to uh, have Raymont uh, join our other transload partners in the gateway. Um, we also have a rail incentive program and uh, partnership with the BNNUP. Our commissioners approved this program earlier this year. It is resulting in uh, a larger number of uh, import uh, intact intermodal rail uh, cargo containers moving through our gateway. And this is really important because most of that cargo is what we call discretionary cargo. It's cargo that can move through any other gateway in North America 
to those uh, inland markets. And by partnering with the railroads, we've been able to shift some of that cargo that was moving uh, through other gateways back into uh, Seattle, Tacoma. And then the last uh, item is uh, some of these emerging markets I mentioned earlier, uh, Vietnam being one. We held a virtual meeting with many importers and exporters in Vietnam. Unfortunately, we couldn't be there in person yet. We used technology and uh, shared with them the value proposition of this gateway. And there were more of these types of virtual meetings to come. Um, hopefully next year we'll be able to travel again to some of these emerging uh, countries. Um, yet in the meantime, we are reaching out to them and making sure they understand what we have to offer here in Seattle, Tacoma. Next uh, slide. So in wrapping up, um, what I, what I want to just uh, leave you with is that, um, yeah, it's been a, a really challenging year. 2021 will be a better year. We believe that. It still will be uh, uh, with its challenges. And um, we are committed to approaching the marketplace in new and different ways as we are forced to by the uh, overall changes in the global economy. And, uh, and I, I truly believe this, that our Seaport Alliance uh, business is going to be part of the solution that pulls us out of these difficult economic times. And so we need to continue to invest in this gateway so that we have really good family wage jobs here in this region. And with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, Barbara. Thanks. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. Uh, this is Sarah. Uh, Sarah, thank that's you. That's okay. Thanks <laughs> to our friends from the Port of Seattle and the Northwest Seaport Alliance for that presentation. Um, I wanna thank all the speakers, John Talton, Director Lisa Brown, Port Commissioner Peter Steinbrook, Steve Metrick, Port of Tacoma Commissioner President John McCarthy, and John Wolf. Thanks to today's forecast breakfast sponsors, the Seattle Propeller Club, the Port of Seattle, King County Maritime. Special thanks to our breakfast presenting organizations, the North uh, Seattle Industrial Association, the American Waterway Operators, Northwest Marine Trade Association, the Transportation Institute, Seattle Marine Business Coalition, National Fisherman Magazine, and the Pacific Marine Expo. And thank you to all of you for attending this 2020 virtual maritime economic forecast. I'm wishing all of you a happy holiday season and a prosperous and healthy new year. Um, this concludes our program for today. We are so happy you joined us. We are adjourned. Thank you.